joining us um, in our Chicago Votes Unlock Civics Week. Uh, we are having our next public training in our series of public trainings for organizers and folks that want to come hang out with Chicago Votes and our Democracy Corps fellows. Um, and so today our public training is on voting in prison and we're going to give some background, some context, some space for y'all to engage in discussion with us. Um, so we're very, very excited. So this is our agenda for today. Um, this is, we're gonna start off with a little bit of who are we? Um, we're gonna go over some terms and language. As we go through this presentation today, we wanna be very mindful about the language that we're using. Uh, there's a lot of terms that have been popularized through media and just through discourse that we wanna start to dismantle a little bit. Um, and so we're gonna go over that. Um, then we have some amazing and beautiful words from one of our colleagues who is currently incarcerated at Stateville. We sent him a couple questions to help us frame today. We're gonna give it over to Ronaldo Hudson, our um, amazing guest that we're so excited to have with uh -huh. us and on Zoom. Um, we're gonna do a little bit of context around felony disenfranchisement across the U.S. and then dive in directly into what's going on in Illinois. Um, and then we're going to talk about what we're going to do and how we're going to do it, all things voting in prison, and have a good discussion um, and maybe have y'all do a little bit of research. All right. All right, hi everybody, I'm Katrina Fid, she, her pronouns, um, and I'm the communications associate at Chicago Votes. Um, a little bit of background on Chicago Votes for those of you who are new. Um, we are a nonpartisan nonprofit organization that's working to build a more inclusive democracy by putting, hand, putting power in the hands of young Chicagoans. Um, we're working to engage um, and develop a new generation of leaders by opening the doors of government and politics to young people through all corners of the city. Um, and then we're also changing laws while we're at it. Um, so we also push legislation. Um, some terms and language to go over briefly. Um, so we use the term American legal system rather than criminal justice system. And the reason we do this is because um, the criminal justice system labels people as criminal um, and assumes the system is just. Um, so by saying American legal system, we are removing um, the criminal label from it and also recognizing that the system is not just. Um, a term that we use a lot and uh, you'll hear a lot throughout the presentation is disenfranchised. And this term just means to take away the right someone has to vote. Um, so that's what disenfranchise is. Um, another thing that we do at Chicago Votes is we always use people first language. Um, so when referring to people involved um, or impacted by the legal system, we use people first language. So we say people experiencing incarceration, community members in prison, rather than using labeling language such as inmate. Um, and then something to be aware of as we move through this that'll help clarify um, things we talk about is the difference between prison and jail. So prison and jail are not synonymous terms. They cannot be used interchangeably when talking about um, laws and things like that. Um, so jails are typically short-term holding facilities for the newly arrested, those awaiting trial or sentencing, and those serving misdemeanor sentences under one year. Um, and they are under local jurisdiction. So Cook County Jail is under the jurisdiction of Cook County. Um, and people in Illinois, and people in jail across the country have the right to vote. Um, prisons, on the other hand, are under the jurisdiction of the state or the federal government. And they are where people who have been convicted um, are sent and they are serving typically longer sentences. And people in prison are unable to vote in Illinois. So those are just some things to be aware of. So 
when preparing for this presentation, um, Chicago Votes, one of our programs is our Unlock Civics program that works in the intersection of the American legal system and the right to vote. And so the work that we do, and specifically the policies that we push that have to do with folks in the American legal system or prisons themselves, we want to ensure are being led by the folks most impacted by this work. And so we work inside Stateville Prison with folks that are currently incarcerated um, to lead issues that they care about, such as the right to vote. And so I sent a couple of questions to one of our, you know, best buddies, people that we love, named Mike, um, who is currently at Stateville. And so I'm going to just read some of the responses that he sent to us to you. So when asked um, why is the right to vote for folks that are incarcerated important to you, he said, it's important to me because having been privileged to be a part of the discussion that led to our passage of House Bill 2541, which is our civics and prison bill um, that mandates folks getting out of prison have access to peer-led civics classes. He said that I've experienced firsthand the sense of purpose that civic engagement engenders. Such a right, I believe, would have a profound positive impact on the psyche of men and women and people in prison, many of whom have harbored mind states of hopelessness and vacant esteem prior to and during imprisonment. When asked, how did you come to learn about felony disenfranchisement? He said, I learned about not being able to vote due to being convicted of a felony and while in prison at the age of 17. I did not learn about felony disenfranchisement and its effects on individuals, communities, and nation until I took the law, politics, and mass incarceration college course through Inside Out at DePaul University. When asked, how do you think restoring the right to vote for folks that are incarcerated would benefit communities as a whole? He said, restoring the right to vote to those of us who are incarcerated will benefit communities as a whole as it would remove us from this underclass of outcasts that disenfranchisement creates, thereby preparing and enabling us to fully rejoin society. This in turn, will lead us to, de to a decrease in criminal activity. And when asked, what do you believe are the biggest obstacles to enfranchising currently incarcerated folks? He said that the biggest obstacles are elected officials who wish to maintain a status quo of inequity and inequality. These politicians are influenced by big money industries while sophisticated marketing and lobbying strategies and corporations that depend on punitive legislation rather than law and policy that focuses on rehabilitation. And they do this in order to maintain incarceration and to make a profit. And so those are just some words from Mike and to help us frame today. And so now um, to also continue with helping us frame this, we are so, so happy and appreciative of, you know, Illinois Prisoner Project, Prison Project for connecting us with the wonderful Ronaldo Hudson, um, who is here today. Um, literally, if y'all are watching our social media, we posted a video of him on the day of his release talking about the right to vote and the importance of the right to vote. And so with that, I'm going to give you the floor, Ronaldo um to say what you need to say and folks can feel free to also ask Ronaldo questions in the chat um or elsewise you need help unmuting yourself Ronaldo <laughs> I so I'm gonna do this There you go. Hello, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you hear me? Because this, my screen is really just jumping all over the place. This technology is crazy. But can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry that 
my picture is steady jumping out on my screen for some reason. But as long as you can hear me, I'm so, so excited to be here with you guys. I am extremely humbled by the opportunity to speak to you guys about the importance of the right to vote. I will give you a little background if you will allow me. And it's to talk about the fact that I've been in prison. I was in prison 37 years. So I sat in the Cook County Jail for seven years. So when you, some of the things that's gonna be discussed today is about, for example, the difference between a prisoner, right? The rights of a prisoner taken versus the rights of a pretrial detainee. I was a pretrial detainee for seven years in the Cook County Jail, but I was stripped from the right to vote until Harold Washington, some, I don't know who's old enough in this group to actually remember Harold Washington was the first black mayor of the city of Chicago. But I voted in his election. That's the only time I had a chance to vote in the Cook County Jail. So I spent seven years in the Cook County Jail, 13 years on Illinois' death row because the state of Illinois decided that there was nothing redeemable about me and that the best thing for society was, was to execute me. But they did not prevail by the grace of God. I'm so excited by that fact. And so Governor Ryan commuted my death sentence to life without the possibility of parole. And I love when you talk about the importance of the right to vote, the fact that Governor Prisker was able to be elected, I'm not asking anyone to vote for anyone in particular, but I will tell you that the change in the election affected the fact that my story was actually heard. And so Governor Prisker decided that he would grant me a commutation of sentence. So I went from seven years in the Cook County Jail, 13 years on death row, to life without the possibility of parole, to a commutation of my time, sentence to time considered served. And so when I walked out, I was hearing little conversations about people not thinking that it's important to vote. And I was like, that is crazy. Do you know that it is so important every state's attorney in the state of Illinois are elected officials? Judges are elected officials. Legislators are elected officials and they must answer to the people that vote. So when you think about all the thousands of people that are sitting in prison without the right to vote, when I read my commutation paper, I was so excited. I don't know if you can see this. Can you guys see this? You all? This is the actual uh, official document that the governor issued out and it said to me, and I just want to share this. It says, Know ye that I, J.B. Prisker, governor of the state of Illinois, by virtue of authority, meaning by virtue of the vote of the people of Illinois, right to vote, right? By virtue of the authority vested in me by the constitution of this state, do by, the, do by these present commutation of sentence to Ronaldo Hudson. But here's, here's where it's wonderful. He says, it of, I have commuted his sentence, but I have acquitted him of, and discharged him of all and from all further imprisonment and restored to all, the, he has been restored to all the rights of citizenship. I can, I can vote, right? You hear that? I can vote after 37 years of incarceration. How could you possibly ask someone like me, is it important to vote? It is extremely important that everyone that's of age who has the legal right to vote, 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 vote. It is cru crucially important because people that are in office listen to the people that vote. They don't listen to the people that don't vote. I can't express that enough times. So for me, I'm in the process of being identified, of identifying myself, getting my social security card and everything in order. And I'll more than likely have to walk into a polling station, but I can assure you I'm going to walk in there proudly with a big smile on my face saying, I know the importance of this day. And I will not try to direct anyone's uh, vote in any direction. But if you can look at this smile, you can kind of imagine like what I would vote for people that make you smile. And so, okay, I won't do it. But I'm telling you that I love the fact that I have the right to vote now and I have the ability to say to everyone in society, 
Don't take it for granted. Don't cry if you don't step out. If you don't step out and vote, if you don't register to vote, it's only on you. If you need help, reach out to Chicago Vote. I'm gonna try to connect with them as much as I can. If I had to come and carry you on my back to the polls, I have a strong back, I'll carry you. If I have to get someone and solicit someone to get a bus, I will be fully engaged. In fact, I'll start raising money now so that I can rent a bus so that we can ensure that you make it to the polls. It is extremely, extremely important that you vote. And I can't say that enough. Is there any questions? Hello, somebody. Right on. <laughs> Do you feel me? Yep. All right. Ronaldo, can you talk a little bit more about the type of, you know, although you didn't have the right to vote, I know that that didn't stop you from being very engaged. Um, can you talk a little bit about the civic engagement and community organizing you did while you were incarcerated? Oh, listen, I first of all, I have to thank you guys because I did not know that the 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 civics class actually came from you all's effort. And I was a peer educator in Danville Correctional Center and they began to pass out the paperwork to teach guys that and everyone their constitutional rights, like you have the right to the following. And so we began to actually facilitate with our peers the importance of knowing who you are. But the thing that bothered me, and I have to confess this, is it was such a disheartening thing to know that you can see so much going on, but had so little power over it. And so I was always bothered by the fact that, you know what, they are defining me by my sentence. They're not defining me. They're defining me by an act in my life that I'm extremely responsible for. I'm the person responsible for why I went to prison, but I'm equally responsible for the person that I've become today. And so I'm not just my worst decision. You know, that was a bad decision. That was a childish decision. That was a horrible decision. But that decision compelled me to come to the state that I say, okay, now I have to step up and say, I am better than that. And you can't make me less than. So we began to talk with the wardens and, and the administration in Danville Correctional Center. And they asked me a question. If I had a program, what would it look like a mentoring program? And so we came up with the groundbreaking program called the Building Block Program, just for the record, right? I am the founder, co-founder, like the author of it. So I'll definitely share what we did. And so in our program, we taught classes such as the constitution, your constitutional right. So we were teaching in a prison setting where they expected us to be talking about dominoes and spades. We were talking about the process of voting. And that one guy taught me and, and said, listen, a brother by the name of, of Anthony Brown, who's very active right now, he's out and he's dealing with voting in central Illinois. But he told me, he said, listen, brother, once you walk out of prison, your right is restored to vote. But we have to figure out how to give you your right as a citizen while in prison because they're taking censors, right? And these little towns that they have us imprisoned in, they're getting the resources from our bodies and we have no, no we receive no benefit and we're only talked about and mistreated. And so we begin to say, let's have a youth think tank. We had a youth think tank in prison, right? Because all of the great ideas, not to say anything to those of us that are 50 and older, like I'm 56 years young, but I love the youth because I know what the future looks like. And so we had a youth think tank and these young, these young brothers begin to talk about, hey man, I never voted, I never registered, I never had a driver, I never, and they begin to plot out what they wanted to do with their future. And so, so much stuff. So the, the, the building block program allowed us to have a space in a prison setting where we taught Spanish classes. We taught uh, uh, financial literacy. We taught effective communication. Like y'all see my smile, right? One of the things that I share with people is that if you want to thaw a room out, smile, smile, right? And you're gonna do one or two things. You're either gonna, you're gonna make people open up and say, let me see what you got to say behind, behind that smile, or you're gonna run some devils out of the room just because they don't like the light. And smiles bring light, the, our smiles bring light into the room. So anyway, we were so engaged in trying to make sure 
that we begin to educate ourselves because the Illinois Department of Correction, even though there are some good people within the walls, I won't try to pretend that there's not, but they have a philosophy that does not promote me being an independent. Independent people vote, dependent people don't. When you're a prisoner, you're made a dependent. So I was a dependent for 37 years. I broke the chain. I divorced the Illinois Department of Correction before I ever walked out for irreconcilable differences. I didn't like the way they treated me. I didn't like the way they put, they had me in a bunk bed and I am too big of a man to be in a bunk bed. I'm talking about I needed to be able to breathe and move. So we began to make a long story short to design our own rehabilitation. And the first thing I began to talk to the guys about is know who you are, know what your rights are, even while in prison. And so we did that through our constitutional class as well as through the work that comes from Chicago Vote. I'm so excited to learn that now, right? So we began to teach those basic principles about the constitution and how it guarantees you the right to different things. I'm just speeding, so I'm sorry. Do you need to ask a question? This is great. Um, do other folks have questions for Ronaldo? Uh, Mr. Hassan, um, we appreciate you uh, speaking to us today. And uh, it's great that you're with us now on the outside. I want to ask, uh, what kind of mental strength and capacity would a uh, man have to have to have survived for so long in the, in the complex? Well, I'll tell you this. I'm a man of faith. And so my faith maintained me, but I'll be honest, it was more, in all honesty, I have a tender heart, but a tough mind. And so what I learned is that you have to have heart because a lot of incarceration takes away the heart of people. And if you don't protect your heart, then you begin to become infected with the poison of incarceration. And so you have to protect your heart. You know, and that's what got me through so many years, so many tears. And I would not lie and say I did not cry some nights. I would not, I would not lie to you all and say I did not have struggles. But I knew that if I keep holding on, there would be a moment in which we would bust through the storm. And the Illinois Prisoner Project, with that wonderful team led by Jennifer Sobel, I love them. That's the team I'm working with right now. But they're my angels. And they, groups like you all, Chicago Vote, they love you, by the way, Chicago Vote. Jenny told me to make sure I tell you guys that she love you. And she said, make sure I tell you that. So be clear so that I don't get in trouble. Y'all make sure y'all email her and tell her Ronaldo did say that he loved, that you all love, she love you guys. But I really want to tell you, listen, it takes a tough mind, but a soft heart. Don't let your heart become an and contaminated with all of the darkness that you will face in the struggle to be educated in this process. It's an ugly system. It's not designed fairly, but we together we can beat it. We can change it to what we want it to look like. And so by the grace, I just kept fighting and people kept believing in me. And that gave me the energy to believe in myself. So if you believe in yourself, people will start coming to you. They'll start believing in you as well. Love Thank it. you, Mr. Hudson. We have another, maybe one more. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the program that we, the civics program that we came up with in the book, Know Your Rights, was that helpful? Were there things that you would add to it in addition to what's there? Absolutely. First of all, it was extremely helpful. Uh, it was something that the Department of Corrections simply did not have. And I, didn't, I don't think they wanted us in many cases to understand those rights, you know? And so it really, and it still is in the process because like I'm gone now, I was a head peer educator. And so I was very progressive about talking with the wardens and being in their face about what we can or cannot do, you know? And so everyone, everyone doesn't do that. Like a lot of people are very, Prison will make you very, very passive, you know, because you don't want to offend anyone because they'll lock you up. So you have to try to figure out how to navigate. But when, they, when it became law, it was so funny because they were trying to figure out how to incorporate it with 
what we generally teach the prison population. And as a peer educator, like my job was basically to orientate uh, my peers to what was available in the prison. What I love about what you, what you all put together is it began to orientate people, orientate people about how to be a citizen. And so I definitely would love to sit down with you at another time if possible to go over it in detail because I don't have it in front of me. And I, would, I, would not, I don't want to misrepresent what I thought was an extremely great package. You know, and I promise you, I do know in Danville, specifically a warden by the name of, of Kim Larson was very progressive about getting that program going and incorporating it into the orientation uh, of the prison. So in fact, it's a brother that I left down there by the name of Lawrence Green, who's actually teaching it now. Well, they're not teaching it right at this moment because of the COVID-19, but we're teaching it within our program that I designed called the Building Block because we're still teaching on the wing. And it's amazing that we were insightful enough to begin to think about what if the system stopped helping us, we're able to help ourselves. So uh, it's definitely something that is very helpful. It was extremely needed. And so thank you, thank you, thank you. I can't say that enough. I know we do wanna move along. Is, is there one more question for Ronaldo? I feel like people have them. All righty, well, we're gonna keep it moving. And if you have more questions for Ronaldo, please put it in the chat um, or we'll come back to it at the end. Um, or else we're gonna keep moving with the presentation. And thank you, Ronaldo, for being here. We love and appreciate thank you. you. Thank you all for having me. I really am excited to be here. Y'all all are lovely. <laughs> Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you, Ronaldo. All right. That was wonderful. Thank you. All right, moving the conversation along. Um, we are just gonna talk about felony disenfranchisement um, briefly and like the history of it um, and how it varies by state. Um, so felony disenfranchisement um, is the removal of the right to vote on the basis of a felony. Um, so that can be what it is in Illinois, which is specifically people serving sentences in prison, um, or that can be what it looks like in other states where you can't vote even when released um, if you're still on parole um, or probation. So it varies state by state. Um, but the history of it is interesting. So southern states started to develop these different ways of disenfranchising um, specifically black people once um, slavery was over and they had to find a way to ensure um, that black people would not have the political power um, that they were so afraid of. So it started um, during Reconstruction and post-Reconstruction, um, and it's continued now. And states are beginning to repeal some of the felony disenfranchisement laws. Um, but as of today, there are only two states in the U.S. that allow people to vote in prison, and those states are Maine and Vermont. And then Puerto Rico uh, also allows people to vote in prison, um, but Puerto Rico is a state. Um, and then also to note, uh, so different states are doing different things to restore the right to vote. So Iowa was the last state that permanently banned um, people from voting that had felonies for the rest of their life. Um, and they just repealed that, there are some carve outs, um, but now no state in the US um, prohibits people from voting for life um, due to a felony, um, but all of, 48 states have some sort of felony disenfranchisement. Um, so now we can have a little bit of a discussion around that. Um, if you have questions, feel free to ask. Um, but we have some discussion questions here on the slide. So we just wanna have an open conversation um, about why do you believe there is opposition to allowing people in prison to vote and how would you respond to opposition? Um, I feel like they don't allow people to vote in prisons because, like, they want to, like, control them. Like, they want to make them feel like 
oh, you did something to deserve to be in here, like, then you don't have any rights, like, whatsoever. Like, whatever's going on in the outside world, like, you are not a part of that. So I feel like it makes them feel like, so it's like intentionally separating them the two. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That is one of the biggest things that happen in prison is they continually remind us that we're less than everyone else and that they are above us. And if we wasn't in prison, then we could speak, let alone talking about voting. And so it is extremely important that people begin to know that their tax dollars are actually being used for people to actually abuse people rather than help people to become better. And that's another reason why it's important to vote. You know, that if you want your tax dollars to actually be used for the actual thing that you're paying taxes for, then you have to vote. And so they definitely uh, try to disenfranchise us. And it, it happens every day when you think about like, man, I want to, I, I have an opinion about this, but I better shut up. And that is make a lot of people come home very in a really bad state. And so I just, it's hard, but after so many years, I can see it. I'm sober today and I'm conscious of how valuable, like, I hope you guys really don't take this, please do not take it for granted that it could be you sitting in a cell tomorrow. It could be someone you dearly love sitting in a cell tomorrow. Your vote could make the difference on how they're treated in that cell. Other thoughts? I also, um, I believe mainly because when it comes to um, people in prison voting, they're the ones that's mainly directly impacted. Like, you know, we, uh, the, the judges and stuff is all on a ballot. It's bigger than just the presidential election. Uh, so it's pretty much taking away their voice because those are the ones who, who actually really need it. So it is, um, it's, it's pretty much like slavery. Um, well, it is slavery. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So they're uh, they're just making um, the well, pretty much not allowing them to vote in prison. It keeps them there because they don't um, have the ability to take oh, vote out these judges who are impacting me right now. Who's who's uh, being racist or who doesn't care about the situation or really like taking a time out to actually like look at what's here and what's presented so it's yeah that's a huge reason why they don't want them to vote because then we wouldn't have these kind of situations where there are people who's wrongly incarcerated right now or in there for petty charges and stuff yeah and just to like echo that point too it's like and also like people aren't able to like even communicate with people of influence like and tell their stories you know what i mean to like be in those positions to like kind of change these things politically um and so like we forced to kind of subject ourselves to like homogenous like echo chambers of being like these are the values that we hold into place and blah 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 but like we, we aren't hearing other people's stories because they're like being suppressed so feels like it's like the carceral system for the most part is is all about de you know making people not citizens taking away your rights you know our rights and i don't know what else i was going to say but <laughs> um it, that it feels like a loophole written in like you know when um uh, i get my amendments confused but the one that supposedly ended slavery but still allows it in prison which i mean that's what it feels like if you're 13th like, amendment yeah thank you because i'm I know that I don't know some of the piece of this, but it definitely still resonates that they wrote a loophole in that and, and that's how they got people. And this is so anti-democratic and anti-American and racist. So well, one of my the soapbox for you, <laughs> sorry. I, I am old enough to remember when Harold Washington ran and we went to the jails to register people and when the election was over, there was some reporter reported on the fact that he won 
in a sense by the margin of people in the jails who were <laughs> pre-detainees who voted. The, the, the amount of votes he won by was very similar to the number of detainees that were registered in the jail. So they have always wanted to stop voting in the jails. And of course they don't want it in the prisons because God forbid you voted for an amendment that would allow you to d take a census count in the jail and then put your Chicago South Side address as opposed to the jail. That would change the whole population and change the number of Congress people we have, for example. If people who were in prisons were able to do a census count, for example. So it, it's all kind of a game to them to keep you uh, on a hook, for lack of a better way of putting it. Absolutely. I would uh, like to just go ahead, bro. Oh, uh, thank you. So uh, I feel like they, um, they don't want uh, people on the inside to vote based on the fact that um, the prison complex, since it is a treated as a business, would no longer be as so. Uh, just because uh, people that don't have a voice would have a voice and through their vote and be like, yo, this needs to stop. And I, I feel as if more progressive actions would be taken with having people that are directly impacted um, voicing their um, voicing their experience. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I know from personal experience of experience being experiencing being disenfranchised that there have been so many issues within the public that's going on in the world that was affecting my family, that is affecting, you know, those that I love. And I knew that not only was I sitting in prison, but I could not have a, I no longer had a voice in what was going on, even though I was, taxpayers were paying for me to sit here and not have a voice. And just think about how, you know, crazy that is in itself, that we can be, you all, not me, you were paying for me to sit in the cell and watch television, right? But you could not use my, I could not voice the concerns of my family in an election, be it local or statewide or across the country. So it's important that people understand that if we go in Danville, for example, the prison I just left, the prison population has the ability to have 1,800 people. That can turn an election. We know that we have people in office right now who are in office with 900 votes, less than 1,000 votes. So one prison with people being conscious of who they and what they're voting for can actually have an impact. And so it's definitely very, very questionable as to why laws exist to disenfranchise people. We can debate about the motivation, but we know it's been going on long enough and we're now tired of it. And by the grace of God, people will begin to speak toward it and step up and say, I'm not just going to talk about it. I'm going to vote about it. And so I'm excited by this. Yeah. Also, I, oh, sorry. <laughs> you go ahead. Uh, also, I just, I kind of feel like to me, they don't want people to vote. It's because they want them to be like, right, like ignorant. Like there are people who, you know, they don't want them to be like, oh, you know, you, you don't need to worry about this stuff, right? Like whatever's going on and goes on, like you don't need to worry about that, we'll take care of it. But it's like, if people aren't talking about things like people like in prison, right? You know, even think like when people get out of prison, right? It's hard to maintain like a job. It's hard to maintain a resume, clothing, right? Sometimes people who go to prison are put back into the same environment that most likely put them in prison in the first place. So programs like that are like super helpful, but it's like, you know, if we don't have anyone talking about them, then then just like, oh, okay. Like, you know what, don't worry, don't worry about us, right? So, and it's, it's no wonder why like a majority of white people who are older are the ones voting while more POCs that are younger are most like more not, like not voting as much. So I think it's like also pure ignorance. They want us to be ignorant. Yeah. Kia, were you going to say something? Well, um, just, well, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. I just wanted to say, I think it's important. Like, you know, they have a law right now 
that requires what's called uh, ABE, mandatory school. If you score below a 6.0, then you have access to mandatory school, right? Think about it, a grown, a grown person, be it male or female, walk into a room and say, we just only want you to be able to follow a basic instruction. We don't care if you can actually congregate a verb. We don't care if you can actually write a letter saying, I don't like what's going on, right? Go and lock up, lock up and shut up. And taxpayers' money is paying for that. So yes, when we wake up and start saying, we're going to put people in office that actually know what our concerns are. They know that every person that's a, a citizen of Illinois should have the right to vote even if they're in prison, that is big. It's what, 39 to 40,000 people in prison. Imagine what that can do in any election, be it if you voting right or left. Kia, did you have something or else we can move on? Um, I was just kind of gonna speak to, I guess how, you know, Kiara spoke to how like, this is and named how this is just legalized slavery, right? And it's exactly what Ronaldo was saying as well. Like when the question of how do you respond, you know, to people who um who who feel that way, right? I feel like we can go on and on about all the reasons why it, <laughs> disenfranchisement is real, right? But there will always be people who who disagree. I have people like that in my family, right? <laughs> um, and it's just sort of like how do you engage with that? And it's just like it is so intentional, like you have to also just make sure that you're paying attention to the ways that it's used, right? Like the school to prison pipeline is real. We use jailing and incarceration with children in juvenile detention centers to eventually just kind of condition them <laughs> to set them up to be treated as villains and they're already targeted if they're black and brown. And then it's like, you know, like we have the, like prisoners being, uh, acting as firefighters in California right now, just free labor, right? We have privatized prisons where people are just businessmen and they're just profitizing off free labor. Um, so it's like, it's not this idea that it's ever been about, you know, serving your, your debt to society. It has nothing to do with any sort form of reform or retribution. It's just all about profit and politics. And it's just like, when something is that intentional, you can't have any other baseline. I don't think there's any other baseline argument for any other form of equity <laughs> if we are still profiting from slave labor, <laughs> you know? So it's like everything else is pretty much removed if we don't address that we're still, you know, <laughs> locking people up. Just, just to hone in real quickly, you know those very people that are fighting fires and are firemen out of prison cannot have a job as a fireman upon their release but yet they're fighting fires right now you know and so this is serious business this is very serious business you know and they understand that uh when we start to wake up we become empowered you know and so i say wake up wake up wake up and don't don't you dare go back to sleep I know that uh, California actually just passed a bill that uh, will allow inmates that are helping fight the fires um, will be able to um, become full-fledged firemen um, All right. after they are released. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. All right. To keep it moving, um, we're just going to go into some more specifics about Illinois. Um, and felony disenfranchisement here. Um, so currently in Illinois, only people that are currently serving sentences in prison are not allowed to vote. Um, so once you are released, you are eligible to vote. You just need to re-register. Um, other things to note, um, we passed legislation making Cook County Jail an official polling location. And Yay. then other jails, yes, other jails throughout the country um, are required by law to come up with a system to let people in jail vote absentee. Um, we also have our civics in prison bill, which we've talked about. So now um, all people leaving prisons and juvenile detention facilities throughout the state of Illinois receive peer taught civics classes um, so that they are aware of their rights and their civic um, responsibilities once they are released. 
Um, given this um, information, there is still a lot of misinformation out there about voting rights. A lot of people think that they um, are unable to vote for the rest of their life if they have a felony in Illinois, which is not the case. Um, a lot of people don't know people in jail have the right to vote. Um, and that um, misinformation kind of clouds conversations and prevents a lot of people from voting and also um, makes it more difficult to pass legislation when people don't actually know the current state of things. Um, so a question we can pose to the group to talk a little bit about is how can we work together to correct misinformation about voting rights? Well, one suggestion that I would make is just like, well, as a prisoner, they taught, they taught us to facilitate information. And I think the more that we take the time to educate, you know, and share panels like this, so and invite more people, like everyone should be committed to say the next panel, I'm bringing four people with me, you know, uh, I think we can spread the message, you know, but it's going to take us actually committing to learning the information so we have a, a place in which we can get the information right powerpoint it right and then get it out there and train people i would love to be a part of that training and and helping to further share the message of how why people don't know what their rights are social media for sure Any other ideas? Did any of you learn about any of this like in high school or were you told false information in school? Um, I was just gonna mention how, can you hear me? Sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, I was just gonna mention having uncomfortable, those uncomfortable conversations with like family members who are either, either believe the misinformation that has been spread or telling them this information, incorrect information. Um, and also bringing it into conversations with friends, like just talking about it like any other topic, like this is affecting our, the most, of, sorry, I, my words, um, by hiding or not bringing it into normal conversations, it's keeping everything in silence. Um, and keeping the ignorance that people aren't aware of what's going on and if keeping the idea that if it's not hurting them, then it doesn't matter, which is obviously not the case. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All the information that I used to get like while growing up was coming from like my older siblings um, because they had all been incarcerated. And so when they would come out and they would speak to me about things that they can't do, I was growing up believing that to be true. And so like, I got a little bit older and got some different information and I had to come back and tell them like, wait a minute, yeah, I've been going about life, <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying, like blind. And uh, that, that's been a cool thing to like navigate with them lately. But um, all of my, all of like the, I guess, correct information now has been coming from like other people who have been incarcerated, but got trained from somewhere else. So I think finding out like where people are and like, so social media as well, place for like more younger, like active people, um, I kind of like congregating, but like also just look at like just different like job industries, like food service industry, things like that, where like we get like just training us into like just different industries and then they can spread the information through like, you know, networks of like friends, family and just community in general. So. Yeah. Any final thoughts on this? All right, we can move it forward. Okay, Alex, this is all you. So now let's talk about the nitty gritty of voting in prison. We can definitely talk about why it's important, why it's needed, but we also need to talk about how the heck we're actually going to get it done. Um, and so folks may already know, but uh, the disenfranchisement of folks that are incarcerated is part of our Illinois Constitution. And so we need to change our Illinois Constitution. The question is, how do we do that? Um, so we need to identify where exactly we need to change. So in Article 3, which is Suffrage and Elections, Section 2 is Voting Disqualification. This is the exact uh, words out of our Illinois Constitution. 
a person convicted of a felony or otherwise under sentence in a correctional institution or jail shall lose the right to vote, which shall be restored not later than upon completion of his sentence. Um, and so there are some key wording in here to keep in mind. It says, which the right shall be restored not later than upon completion. So in that type of language, one could interpret it that someone could get their right to vote before um, the completion of their sentence because the constitution just says um, and women can vote in prison because this says his so <laughs> so if we wanted to so folks caught that it seemed like some folks caught that they didn't want the right to vote and so we'll get to that in the next slides so step one is to change the illinois constitution you must receive um, a two-thirds vote, so a veto-proof uh, vote in both the Illinois House and the Illinois Senate. So that is at least 71 votes in the House and 36 votes in the Senate um, on the proposed amendment. And then once, so we will, so that is step one. And then also step one, is because of that little nuance in the Illinois Constitution, folks caught that and they also passed a law to kind of clear up or clarify um, that people lose their right to vote throughout the entire time they're incarcerated. Um, and so there is a law that we also need to change in our election code. And so HB 4377, is a bill that was proposed by LaShawn Ford um, that will amend the election code to repeal the, prohibition, the provision that prohibits a person that is serving a sentence of confinement in any penal institution from voting until his or her release from confinement. So not only do we have to take the first step in changing the constitution, we also have to remove this um, provision. And so the next, so there are two steps to the constitutional amendment. Um, first, it was getting the two thirds vote from our House and our Senate. Then it goes to us, the voters. So many folks may have heard about the fair tax or the graduated income tax. Um, that had to go through the same process because to change our tax code, it's also a constitutional amendment. Um, and so this would be step two. This would probably be a very exciting vote for us all to get to vote on, um, re-enfranchising folks. So step one though would be, we would have to get the two thirds vote in the House and the Senate. And then we can all throw a huge parade to the polls because by then COVID will be over um, and we can all vote on this together and throw a huge party. Yay. So that is, um, that was like the breakdown of like, how do we do voting in prison? Um, and so do people have questions? Did I miss anything? No, I think you did wonderful. Thank you, Renata. <laughs> um, Hello. Alana. Oh, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, I had a question for Ronaldo, actually, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your experience, Ronaldo, working as a peer teacher? What age do you think uh, civic education should be taught in schools? I'm assuming, of course, like this is already not taught in high schools. or I, I actually think it should start in grade school. I think that it's a mistake to begin to try to teach a an, young an adult, you know, about things that at that age is not really that interesting. Like it's really not that interesting to learn about the constitution. It's not really that interesting, but if you start, I think at a much younger age, right, where it began to become a normal part of the teaching learning process, I think it would be so much better. I think it should be a part of prevention. You know, when they talk about, uh, crime prevention. I think people becoming more conscious of the fact that 
the reality, y'all can tell me if I'm wrong. I do not think we're going to be able to get rid of law enforcement. So what if we begin to educate a group of children that are our children being raised up to represent us? And so if you start talking, I'm using that as a simple example, is at a younger age, people will begin to understand their responsibility, first of all, because once you, like I said, once you get at a certain age, it's just not really interesting. And we cheat and we just let, let, okay, my boyfriend or my girlfriend or my significant other, you help me do this and I'll just turn this in. But when you're young, the brain is still spongy. It's still gathering stuff. And it's interesting. Children are so much more interested in information than adults. But just to, just a brief example, when I was arrested in 1983, I was a functioning illiterate. Okay, I could not read. If they would have said to me, "Ronaldo, spell apple," and you can go home, I would still be sitting in the cell. So if they would have said, "Okay, spell a," I'd have been like with three E's, like I could not spell, I could not comprehend what was going on with me. And there's so many youngsters today, right? I was a young teenager, the tender age of 19 with the mental capacity of a 12 year old. I'm sharing that to make this point. At 56 years old, I am a college graduate, right? But I think about, okay, how do I now get young people to not experience what I had to experience? And I do believe that educating them about the power of the Constitution, the power of being, being excited about growing into age to vote. And so I do think we should start teaching like at the sixth grade, you know, fifth and sixth grade, to make a long story short. I'm kind of long-winded, so please forgive me. Okay, here we go with my age again. <laughs> When I was in elementary school, you had to pass the Constitution test in order to be able to graduate. What happened to that? When I was in high school, I learned civics, and that's how I knew about voting for president and voting for state senators and U.S. senators and Congress people. And all of a sudden, that just kind of disappeared. We need to go back to that. I agree with you. Sixth to the eighth grade is where they should learn it. That's where I learned it, and I've been involved in politics all of my adult life. Yeah, all of my adult life I have. You know, so I think once you know, when you know better, you do better. That's right. For lack of a better way of putting it. That's right. I think, like, education is, like, it's, it's not always as accessible, too. Because, like, I mean, I also had the Constitution test to graduate, but I know many of, like, my peers, they, they didn't. You know what I mean? Like, they, they went to different schools, you know? So I think that like, that might be strategic or it might be like, you know, coming back full circle to kind of like, just keep information from, from certain people to like repeat, you know, the habits of the community. So. Right. My sister, I was just, I helped my, my sister last night. She's a junior in high school and I was helping her with her American government homework. And she's an honor society, smart kid. She didn't know that there were two senators in her state and i was just like oh my goodness <laughs> i could go i could be an honor society now i should go back to high school <laughs> hey you, i know you, oh, i'm back. sorry ahead, listen i just want to tell you real quick bro you better be careful talking about your sister she find out you know you, you your braids might be missing tomorrow so be careful I'm just saying, man. She's going to be like, you talking about me and stuff. Record it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I will say this. When I took my GED, because yeah, I'm, I'm a graduate now. Thanks for, thank you very much. When I took the GED, hey, what that mean? Y'all got to put me up. Y'all doing all kind of like clap, clap, tip, tip. What that mean? Like Just appreciation. Oh, thank you. But it, so I had to learn the Constitution. But here's the thing that people don't understand. There's 60 questions on the exam in prison. You can miss 30 and they pass you for the Constitution. You know, and so for the record, I, I, I had 58 right on my exam, just for the record, because I was I wanted to know how, why and how they were legally holding me. And so I studied as much as I could 
to try to figure out how do I get my life back, you know? And so I want to remind people, man, that our constitution when executed, right, can work. Mm -hmm. Were there any last thoughts before we use the rest of our time to talk? Um, to kind of go back to the whole education thing, um, if you really break down our education system, it is not designed for us to be successful. Hmm. It is to teach us the basics and not, you know, fully prepare us for the world. Um, if you really look at it, like, if you, if you really want to learn about something, you have to do the research. And if you look at how everybody's learning right now in college courses, the way kids learn right now, nobody's really learning right now through the help of our education system. Like everybody's teach, basically teaching themselves right now. And it's showing one of the major flaws of our education system and why we have fallen back, you know, in so many places for America's number one or whatever. But there's just so much information that is kept from us that would propel us as a, as a society to achieve better. Like, yeah. And on top of that, just looking at like just different learning styles, you know what I mean? Like everybody's learning different stuff. We talking about like teaching constitution. It's like talking about like our interpretation of like what this actually means and how does this like serve us so that I could be interested in it and like decide to like, really that best, like invest myself in like this kind of information and go forward with it so well think about it like this and i can, i'm old enough to remember this y'all can laugh all y'all want you remember schoolhouse rock i'm just a bill yes i'm only a bill and i got as far as capitol hill well now i'm off to the white house while i wait in a line with a lot of the bills for the president to sign right what i'm saying is we can reach all ages right no matter because for the children we'll take them back to schoolhouse rock to the adults right we'll say listen you're old enough to be able to process this information and so i think it's really all hands on deck you know and we can't we can't allow the system that's designed to destroy us to continually say we can't do it we can do it listen i shouldn't be here i talk, and i shared this with people the other day I was sentenced to die, to be executed. I'm a guilty man that by the grace of God, I made it this far from death row to the front door. And so can't nobody tell me we can't do this. That was a task. That was a task to make it and not be crazy, to not be on medication, to not be, you know, having feces and all everything all over me, to maintain my head. I have my dignity. I didn't beg them. You know, I did not, I did not sell my soul I, did, I do not suffer from Stockholm Syndrome, even though I was in prison 37 years. I did not fall in love with my captors. I fell in love with God, and I'm not trying to turn this into a sermon, but only to make this simple point. My faith helped to keep me. Looking at faces like you all maintained me to say there is hope. And so I know if, if we can go through all of that, we can do this collectively. And y'all signed in because y'all are interested enough to be involved. So I want to be engaged. And I want to just say, I want to see us walk across the line and say, we got it passed. Now what's next? You know, uh, uh, what's the brother name? He said some good trouble, right? Uh, you know what I'm talking about. He John, just passed. Lu John, John Lewis. Lewis. We want some good trouble. I'm in for it. I want it. Some good trouble. Let's get it. Yeah. Katrina, should we? I'm thinking, how do you all feel if we, let's see how much I'm able. We can do this question um, as a group and then breakout rooms, Alex, do you think? Sure, can you go to the next slide? What's, what's, what are we, what's the next thing that we're doing? Okay. Oh, doing research to look more into Ooh. things. Hmm, let's yeah. do a discussion yeah. first together. Okay. We don't have to go to breakout rooms. All right, discussion. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so we can all see each other.
Um, but Alex, you want to put this question in the chat? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a nice hat right there. Isn't it? So the don't, question, don't, don't y'all be hating my hat. <laughs> it's a great hat. Thank, thank you very much. They don't let you have it in prison. You look great, Ronaldo. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Two fly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the questions we had is, is there a situation where someone's right to vote should be revoked and who should be the person that makes those decisions? Well, can I start? Sure. If it's okay, I, <laughs> I guess y'all know I'm not bashful. But listen, I sat in prison with from the John Wayne Gacy's to the Ronaldo Hudson's. And I'm going to just jump out here and tell you, I don't think the worst possible human being that you could possibly imagine should be, his rights should be taken solely because we don't like their behavior. I think that there should, I think there should be regulations, you know, to deal with certain issues. But I think it's very, I think it's a very dangerous thing when you strip the right from any person because it's just a matter of time before it gets to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I agree too because um, there's, we're all like bad to someone. We all done something evil to someone. And I feel like no one on this planet should even have the right to take away someone's, you know, right. We all have free will and, you know, voting is an act of free will. Um, this is supposed to technically be the land of the free. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, I think the, um, no one uh, should be denied the right to vote. Although like, yeah, you think of like ethics and moral morality, but still we're all human at the end of the day. We do things to survive. I think Stevie's question is an excellent one. I have no idea what the answer is, but I wish someone had an answer. The vote fraud question. I'm sorry, what's the question again? Yeah, Steve, you mean should it Stevie, could you ask the could you ask the question and like elaborate a little bit more? Yeah, somebody asked me this question and um I regretted the way that I answered it. I basically got defensive and was like, shut up. So I <laughs> it wasn't the uh most mature thing. But the question was, what about people who are in prison for committing election fraud? I mean, I feel like that is such a smaller percentage. Right. Of, um, I mean, I, I still feel like everyone, regardless, should have the right to vote. Like, how, how can someone, I mean, they're already being held captive in prison. There's, they're, all of their rights are already taken away. Like, if if they're committing crimes or being told that they are committing crimes against the law or whatever, it's they they they're still human. They they're still putting in work. Like most, I'm rambling now, and I apologize. But like, it's it's just like how like if they're working and like people who are incarcerated a lot of states they're forced to work and for a few cents. Um, so like if they're still working, still putting in the work to make Victoria's Secret clothing and uh, AT&T uh, calling centers, like they deserve the right to vote. Like if they're doing their due diligence, it, like, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I we think um, we should also unpack voter like vote election fraud. Like I think like our president already spent a whole bunch of money on an election fraud commission that proved that like that's fake. Yeah. So that's not even like a thing. 
I feel like the question more of like, should like the president of Monsanto, who like, you know, folks that are making money off of like um, migrant slave labor, like if they're mm -hmm. held accountable and put in prison, should that person have the right to vote? You know, I have, I have, uh, I don't, it's funny, this feels like this question gets at such a heart, like, I, I do have, like, problems with extreme violence, and so somebody who might have shot 20 people or something like that, um, and so I don't know where those limits are, and it almost feels like, I don't know. I don't know what those limits are, and I almost feel like I would. It's harder to think about that than it is to think that almost everyone should be allowed to vote, rather than who do I think should be the exceptions. Knowing that exceptions do create a problem because the more people who can't vote, the more you set precedents for someone not being a citizen. So I'm not saying I have answers. I'm just spewing opinion here. <laughs> think about it I go back to people who are not in prison for example I think someone should have went to prison for all of those hanging chads that issue I think someone should go to prison for 70,000 voters or whatever the amount was in Michigan that didn't get counted you know where is the judges that didn't count those votes in Wisconsin in 2016 those to me are things that people who would go to prison for that should not be allowed to vote. But it just seems to me that people who really commit election fraud at its highest, like 45 saying vote twice, everybody that has an ounce of sense knows it's against the law to vote twice and to encourage people to vote twice, you need to go to prison for that. You know, that it's just that the people that's election fraud, in my opinion, and people like that are who should be in prison, and they're the very ones who are not. That's yeah. my two cents. Well, can I just just push back a little bit? Because I think it's crucially important. There was a time, like y'all see me and y'all like my shirt and stuff, right? And I look kind of handsome. But there was a time when in my life that even death row inmates didn't want to be around me because I was really, really angry and really, really violent. But all of a sudden, a light came on. And when that light came on, a transformation began to happen in my life. And so I began to stop frowning at people and start smiling. And so it was a years of a process. But what I'm saying in that is saying, when you decide that someone's act is so unforgivable that you're willing to strip them. Just remember that you could potentially make the similar mistake. And so you want to always leave room for the hope that a person can change, you know? And a person that commits election fraud is still a citizen in this country. And so I humbly just say, no one should be restricted. That just, you just have to make sure you control, they get one vote because they know how to cheat. Because you don't kick people out of school for cheating forever, right? You might kick them out of school just for cheating in that, that test. Well, that might have changed. I've been going a while. But do kids get kicked out of school for cheating now? If the principal don't like them. If they're okay, not putting so, their buckets, but, they go. But, but I would humbly say it's okay to see things a little different, but I think we're moving in the right direction. I think. And um, I'll go ahead, Jakari. I was just gonna say, I mean, yeah, like I, I think everybody has the right to vote, like regardless of like what they got going on, like just just echoing Rudy. Because I mean, it it just takes some self reflection to just ask and stuff like, who am I to be taking away somebody's right to vote? You know what I mean? Especially like, especially if we talking about like what somebody has done. It's like I'm not really interested in hearing like the person who's never done anything tells somebody who's done something that they shouldn't be doing. I'm like, you haven't lived then. You know what I'm saying? So I like to just sit back and think like, all right, like I, I don't, I don't have that kind of like dominion to take away somebody else's privilege. You know what I'm saying? Like they're like given right. Everybody else has it. And I only have it because I haven't like 
straight outside to like experience something that like has like provoked me to like do something or like whatever. But if, if I can only like see from my looking glass, I can't take away somebody else's blind. So I, I kind of like uh, Ronaldo, what you had to say about if you're willing to restrict to, to do that to someone, then you have to be able to realize that it could be inside of ourselves to be like when when I think I'm going to the most extreme horrific examples um, of things that I've seen and known of that are trigger warnings if I mention them, you know, so I'm not talking about probably 99.999% of people, but I do think the key to anything of where this makes some kind of sense to me is when Ronaldo, when you say, could you be that person? Would you want to be that person? Would you want to be restrained at that point? I, I don't know. I feel like our whole justice um, approach is, well, us, it's racist, but it's also like not effective to helping or healing anybody. I feel mm -hmm. like what you're saying is going into something, you know, that Jen put in the chat of like, we're talking about restricting the right to vote. Why to use as an accountability measure when we know that prison as an accountability measure is ineffective completely, right? And so we need to figure out how to hold folks accountable in different ways. Like, just, just to add to the conversation, just like prison, you would think would be, okay, these are honorable people that have the badges and they have the keys and they're such law-abiding citizens. And they're some of the meanest, vicious people that walk into, I seen them myself, believe it, 37 years, right? And I'm like, man, I'm a prisoner and I'm nicer than you and you the one with the authority? You know, I'm the one don't want to see anybody harmed. I'm the one that's doing reconcile or, or classes on reconciliation. And I'm the one trying to deal with diversity and I'm the, but I'm the prisoner and you're my keeper. And so I don't want to empower them any further to further make people like worse. So, like we have to figure out how do we like begin to get people to see the real picture. Change is possible. I'm a witness of it. I'm an example of it. Like that, you no. Know, go look at my story. The Chicago Tribune just did my whole story, like kind of like in a condensed version. But what I'm saying that to say that if you look at me right now, you can't imagine what I was when even death row inmates didn't want to be around me. Can you imagine that being disinvited to a death row party? Everybody that's like that's don't nobody want to be around is saying we don't want you around, and that's the same as taking a vote from people. We don't like you because you can never change. But I'm saying anyone can change if I can change and if I can begin to be responsible and think about the constitutional right that I lost because of my foolishness now being restored to me, I'm excited by that. And I'm frightened by the idea that it could be taken because I make a bad decision, you know? And the bad decisions, you should be held accountable. I'm big on accountability, responsibility, the, the principles of my personal life is respect, responsibility, ownership, community, and empathy. And I start with respect because if I respect you, I'll be able to show empathy towards you. And I look at everyone with that with them principles is how do I get people to see that they're just as valuable as I am and I'm just as valuable as they are. And I've made some horrible mistakes. I also, um... I think it's like completely what Bernie was saying in the chat. Like for me, number one, like right to vote, it shouldn't be taken away. You know, rights shouldn't be taken away. Like they're your rights, period. But if we, if I get into any like logistical argument, it's, it doesn't really make any sense if the goal is harm prevention um, because the you're taking away the voice of folks who were put in a situ situation where they caused harm and by, by taking away their voice, we limit the ability to understand how we can prevent harm in the future, right? How we can vote in um, correct judges or resources so that their situations won't happen in the first place. So I think it's really um, counterproductive. Anybody else have something to add or another question?
There's about five minutes left. So if anybody has any other questions, you can put them in the chat or you can ask us right now. Um, the last slide of our presentation was we were gonna break you up into breakout rooms to do a little bit of research on your own, but we don't have time for that because we had such a great conversation. Um, and that is totally fine. But if you want to do more research on your own, I will give you some questions to look into um, that can help you just like think about things and share resources with people in your community. Um, so one question that you all can look into is what efforts are taking place in California to expand voting rights to people with felonies? Um, look into that and then also follow Initiate Justice. Um, they're an organization in California that is doing that work. The second question, what countries allow people in prison to vote? Um, and do these countries share any similarities? Um, think about the two states that allow people to vote in the US, which are Maine and Vermont. Do these states have some similarities? And then look at that on a national or an international level. Um, question three, in what ways is Florida disenfranchising people upon release from prison? Um, in 2016, there was the huge victory of restoring rights to vote, um, but since then there has been a lot of stuff happening, so it's really important to keep up with that. Um, and once you pass a law, it's super important to hold people accountable and keep pushing. Question four, what organizations are fighting against felony disenfranchisement in the U.S. and what legislation are they advocating for? Um, so these are just some questions to get you to continue learning about these things. I'm also going to drop um, our petition in the chat. There it is. This petition includes five pieces of legislation that Chicago Votes is advocating for, including voting in prison. Um, so if we want to make this happen, we have to educate our community and really push for it. So sign this petition, share this petition, have conversations with people. Um, yeah. Any last thoughts from people before we wrap up? Yeah, I would like to share one thought. I hope it's not too much. I would like to challenge everyone here today to encourage at least 10 people to vote. Not try to tell them how to vote, but be responsible for saying, I know that I helped 10 people to make it to the poll or make or mail in voting. But I want to challenge everyone. I'm going to start recruiting today. I think I'm going to get 100 people. So if y'all want to challenge, that's my challenge. They be doing that 30 day challenge, right? Y'all, anybody want to challenge me? That's what I thought. So listen, <laughs> Rhonda forever. But look, <laughs> but I'm serious. Listen, this is so good. <laughs> This is so good. And I'm telling y'all, like, listen, it is so good to be free. Y'all don't understand. Like, I'm telling y'all 37 years, right, of being in a sewage. Y'all know what a sewage is? Sure. I, was I was dumped down in a sewer and said, you're forgotten. And then someone came and turned the light on. And I seen all the feces and everything and said, oh, wait a minute. This ain't cool. And I jumped out and started washing off. And now I'm free and now I'm clean. So... I'm telling you that I take every day, everything is crucially important to me. I hear the squirrels running up trees. Like I just saw, well, downtown scared me. So don't try to invite me, nobody to go downtown. The buildings is too big. Like I need to get some adjusting, right? But like, I want to go to the museum. Like I want to do like, like, hey, hit my Facebook, holler at me. Like I'm very friendly. I might, might be being too friendly. So y'all got to like, give me like some keys, like, no, get away from there. But I'm telling you, I challenge every one of you. We should, we should, we should, how many people here today? We got 93. I could do basic math, right? We should be able to bring a thousand people to the election just from this meeting. Challenge, right? That way you're actually making a difference and you're not just sitting around. We had a wonderful time and we weren't able to hug, but put boots to the ground. Do anybody take my challenge? Will anybody commit? I commit. Right? All right, and that's what I'm talking about, like, because this is what this is really about, is how do you get people to say, we're going to win, and we're going to make sure that people can vote, right? But people know why they're voting. 
why the Constitution was extended, right? How it was amended, like all that stuff is cool to learn. But human contact, the most important thing is, hey, y'all see this smile? Watch this, right? It's because I'm free to vote. And I'm telling y'all, all y'all, y'all rights were never taken. Mine was returned. Mm -hmm. And that's why I smile. And don't let it ever be taken from you. So I'm going to get at least 100 people to the polls or at least 100 people to vote. And I'm going to start keeping my count so that if any of y'all call me, like you, and no, don't, I ain't getting all y'all my number. Some of y'all might be weird. <laughs> <laughs> y'all might, might be calling me talking about, ah, like, ah, what? Who this? Right? But, but serious, like, let's, let's connect. Like, let's keep this, let's keep it going. Like, I want to know what's going on. I pray, I pray for you, right? I promise you, I, this, what you see is what you get, right? So, hey, let's just do it. Like, let's, let's, it should be 10,000 people coming out of here, like, right? And for the record, don't be shy. Like, some people, we need resources, so don't be shy. Like, donate. Like, you know, you might have to do a dollar here, five dollars here. Instead of shake today, like, say, Chicago Vote, we like what you're doing. So we want to keep you doing it. So I just want to encourage that as well. And I'm going to start off with nothing. I ain't got no money. But, but I love y'all. I really love all y'all beautiful faces. And I just want to say thank you for inviting me into the space. I hope I get invited again because I'll show, show up with a different hat. Thank you, Ronaldo. We're going to get you a Chicago Bulls hat. Thank you. <laughs> That'll make me very happy. happy. And I'll do a picture with it on Facebook. Amazing. Like, woo, I got a hat. Thank you, thank you. Everyone could just give a huge thank you to hey, Ronaldo. Thank you, Ronaldo, for coming. Thank you, Ronaldo. Thank you, Ronaldo. I appreciate you. all of you. Thank, thank you, so all you guys, that you that you put this together so that we can be together. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, and I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day. Um, this was recorded, and so we will be able to share it with more folks. Share the petition, sign it. Cool. Thank you, everybody. Have a good rest right. of your day. Bye. Be blessed. Be blessed. All right.